Today we are back in Ephesians chapter 1. And last week we talked about the wonderful hope that we have in Jesus Christ and the power that we have in Jesus Christ. And it is His power working in us, not our power. And it's a wonderful thing because my power is not so much, but His power is limitless. So as we dig into Scripture today, I want us to see this next part. It's not just the hope that we have in Christ and the power that we have in Christ. His power working through us as the church. Today I want us to take a look at the authority that Christ has. And as a result, the authority that the church has. We need to see as we look at this, that there's, there are so many things that we have in Christ that are all pinned to and tethered to our relationship with Him. And that is what is vital uh, to us living the Christian life. So if you look with me today, we're going to reread again, just to put it all in context, we're going to reread uh, this prayer that Paul has for the church here. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Paul says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and not in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places." Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body and the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen, church family. Today, I want us to see this authority that Jesus Christ has, that he has the name above every other name, that he is over all of creation. So when we look at this, look with me again in verses 19 through 20. He says, In this immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. What we're going to see here when we look at this idea of Christ being raised and then seated at the right hand of the Father in these heavenly places, I want us to see that this is an image of Jesus as the conquering king who sits on the throne. That's what I want us to see today. So I want us to see, the first thing I want us to see about this in verse 20, it says he worked in, he worked in, he talked about this power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. This power when he raised him from the dead. Now we know from last week that this power that raised Jesus from the dead, that his resurrection is a demonstration of Jesus's power. But this Resurrection is also a conquering of God's enemy. It is, or is a demonstration of his authority. And if you want to see that, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to see verses 20 through 28. See, Christ's resurrection isn't just raising from the dead and a hope of new life for us. It is defeating something. Jesus is defeating death at the resurrection. And I want us to see this because it has everything to do with his rule and authority. See, if you're a king or a ruler, in order for you to take proper authority of any territory, you have to have defeated the enemies that oppose you in that territory. And I want you to see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 
starting in verse 20. Listen to the, we're just going to pick some pieces out here because I want you to see this. It says in verse 20, he says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That's a nice word for died. He says, For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Pause right there. The one thing we need to see as well as about authority is that we see Jesus' authority to make us alive again. Jesus' authority to redeem us. See, in this context, when we think about Adam, it says, For as by a man came death, by also a man has come resurrection for the dead. He says, For as in Adam all die. Adam was the representative human. He was the first human for the human race. And he is the representative human, if you will. And it's from the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden that all of us have inherited both the sin nature and we have inherited death. And we inherited that from Adam, who is kind of representative of our house or of the human race. You can even see more of this in the book of Romans. But the thing we need to see is, is as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Adam, as a representative for the human race, he sinned. And as a representative of the human race, all the human race is cursed and inherits this sin, if you will, all throughout mankind. However, Christ came. Christ came born of a virgin, perfect, sinless, 100% everything that we should have been. And he was, even though he was tempted by the enemy, he lived a perfect, sinless life. And in that, also being not just fully human, but fully God, he was the perfect representative for the human race to reconcile us to God. And this is what Jesus did in his authority as being the sinless sacrifice, as being fully God and fully man. He was the perfect one to make right that broken relationship with God. He had the authority to do that because of who he was. So when we see that, we see Jesus' authority here, and now we're going to see this authority defeat death. It says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 15, it says, But each in his own order, Christ is the firstfruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So at Christ's return, you see the dead rise, if you will, and get their new glorified resurrection bodies. And then verse 24, it says, Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So when you see this part, as, as Paul is speaking in Ephesians, pointing to the power of the resurrection, he's also pointing to Jesus' authority, because he has the authority to defeat death. And as a coming, conquering king, he defeats all the other authorities and all the other worldly powers. And the last thing to be defeated is the enemy of death. And we will see that when Christ returns and when he makes all things new and we never shed another tear because we are all made right because nothing breaks there, nothing dies there. The enemy, the enemy of death has been defeated by Christ. As a reigning king, he defeats his enemies. And the last enemy to be defeated is death. But then if you look at verse 27 as well of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. If I subject something, I am, if you are a subject, you are under me or under my power or my command. And so right here it says, God has put all things in subjection under his feet. That's like Jesus standing on top He's above it all, is the imagery here. And then he says, But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is, that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him. 
that God may be all in all. <laughs> now that was a whole lot for your brain to chew on right there. But here's the thing. Christ comes and defeats death. And he conquers and rules over all the world. And after he has subjected every opposing force and every enemy, the last enemy being death, you see Christ putting everything in subjection under him. And then it says, it says, Then himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Basically, Christ comes, subjects all things under him, and then he sits down on the throne at the right hand of the Father. Now, here's the thing. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all part of the Trinity. God is three in one. God the Father is fully God. God the Son is fully God. God the Holy Spirit is fully God. Although they all have different functions and roles. When you look at Christ, what Christ does is Christ's purpose. He reconciles humanity to the Trinity. He reconciles humanity to God the Father. Christ is the one who bridges that gap. That's why he subjects all creation under his feet. So after all creation is under the feet, he returns as it sits down at the right hand of the Father. Do you see that? So this is the idea. This is the authority of Christ, that God the Father has put him over all creation. Then, and we'll see soon that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. But the thing we need to see is that, think about this, Jesus comes down to this earth, to a lowly, broken world. He comes all the way down here to reconcile the creation all the way down here so that everything, heaven and earth, will be reconciled to the Father through Jesus Christ. The thing you need to realize is, and it says that God may be all in all. Now, this is not saying that God is everything, uh, God is not this podium. God is not that chair. God is not me. But God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. His authority and power extends in all creation to the highest of heights, to the lowest of low. And the good news about that is it doesn't matter how low you are in your life or your position or your station in existence, God can reach you. And it doesn't matter how high you are. God it says it's filling all in all. God is omnipresent. He can reach you wherever you are. And he can reconcile you to himself. The other things we see in some of these verses, or even when I was talking with the youth last week about the resurrection, but in Isaiah 53, 12, it talks about, Isaiah 53 has an incredible prophecy about the Messiah. And we look at this, I'm just going to read it for you, verses 11 through 13. Or 11 through 12. It says, Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. He shall bear their sins and wrongs. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. This phrase right here in verse 12, it says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. What always confused people before Jesus came, this prophecy is like somewhere between four and six hundred years before Jesus shows up on the scene. And this prophecy about the Messiah, they were always confused that they had this suffering servant and this reigning, conquering king. And they can never reconcile the two. Because right here in the scriptures, you see Jesus suffering for our sins. But then you see a phrase used only for a victor. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. How do you, how do you divide the spoil of your victory with your fellow people if you're dead? And that's where the resurrection comes in. It is a conquest. It is a victory. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 68, 18, it says, You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train, receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God the Lord belong the deliverances from 
death. That's Psalm 68. And even in verse 18 there, it talks again about, about leading a host of captives in his, in his train and, and receiving these gifts and distributing these gifts. Here's this idea. This is a picture of the Messiah who is victorious and ruling and reigning. We think of the authority of Christ we need to realize that Christ has authority over death. That Christ is the victor. He will defeat every power and authority, including the last one, death. So now I want us to see in verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 1. He's at the right hand of the throne of heaven. Verse 20. It says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. That's God the Father seating him at the right hand in the heavenly places. This term right hand is a symbol of being, of sitting on the throne ruling together. Do you see that? Sitting at the right hand of the Father on the throne room. We see this in Hebrews chapter 1. So in Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 2, it says, But in the last days God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Through Christ, God created the world. And then it talks about Christ. It says, He is the radiance, he is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power the universe is upheld by the word of Christ's power and after making purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs point being is that Christ rules in reigns. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. The whole universe is being held together by the word of Christ. Remember John chapter 1? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And it says later in John 1 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. No doubt that Jesus is the word who became flesh. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And it talks about how the Word created everything. And nothing, nothing that has ever been created was created without Jesus making it. That's what, if you read John chapter 1 says. The point is, is that Jesus is not a created being that came to being. Jesus always was. As a matter of fact, he made some Jewish people really angry later in John when he tells them, he says, before Abraham was, I am. That's present tense. That's kind of a transliteration of Yahweh. Okay? I am. I am the self-existent one. So here's the idea. But We see Jesus here sitting at the right hand of the Father in the throne of heaven. If you look at Matthew 26... In verse 64, I'll read, I'll start in 62 and read down to it. But right here, Jesus has finished the Lord's Supper. He has been betrayed by Judas, arrested in the garden. And now before they hand him over to Pilate, they are going to, the Jewish leaders are going to interrogate this blasphemer, Jesus, who makes himself out to be God. And Jesus has been kind of, it's really amazing how Jesus almost plays mind games with them. It really stresses them out. They're trying to figure out, who are you? What are you doing? And uh, in Matthew 26, and starting verse 62, listen to what happens before the high priest. It says, And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his robes, and he, he said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have, no, you have now heard his blasphemy. 
Jesus just said, not only am I the Christ, I will be seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven, ruling and reigning in my return. That is what he said to the high priest. That is what they said was blasphemous because they didn't believe he was the Messiah. They didn't believe he was God in the flesh. And so they accused him of being a blasphemer. And that is why they wanted to kill him. But Jesus makes it clear. He said, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. The other thing we see back in Hebrews chapter 1 I want you to see this in verse 8. It talks about, Hebrews 1 tries to make an emphasis, because there are some people that were trying to deliberately confuse Jesus with an angel. And I know that there are different groups out there today, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, that teach that Jesus was an angel. Here's the problem with that. Hebrews 1 is written definitively to disprove that entire argument, to show that Jesus is unlike anyone or anything else, period. So, Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 8, listen to what he says. He says, but of the Son, the God says, but of the Son, and he's talking about what the Father says about Jesus, but of the Son, he says, your, and listen to how God the Father addresses God the Son. Listen to what he says. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So God talking to God and telling him this. This is how the Trinity works. And then in verse 10 it says, and then it says, and this is something else God said. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. And it says, they will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up, and like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Again, a reference to Jesus, that Jesus never changes, and that he's an eternal being. And then verse 13, and then Hebrews asked the question, for those that still think Jesus is just an angel. Verse 13 says, and to which of the angels has God the Father, has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Do you see it? Seated at the right hand of the Father is a unique position that no mere mortal is allowed to have, but only the Christ. Again, you see this image of the Trinity, but what I want you to see is that Jesus is a conquering king that conquers sin and death. He is ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father. And the natural result? Absolutely everything is under Jesus' authority. Look at verse 21 back in Ephesians chapter 1. When you look at verse 20, it says that he worked in Christ and he raised him up from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And then it says, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Get this, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Jesus' reign at there at the end, it never ends. But it's above all rule and authority and power and dominion. When they reference authorities and powers and dominions, we see a reference to spiritual authority, powers, and dominions. And we also see a reference to earthly rulers. In Acts 4, in Acts chapter 4, the disciples were persecuted. And as they were persecuted, they were led to lift up in God and pray to God. And as they prayed, this is some of what they said. In Acts 4, in verse 24, it says, When they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David your servant said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. 
as they're praying, they're quoting Psalm 2 about the rulers of this world raising up against the Messiah to fight the Christ, the son of David. Okay, this is the idea that Christ is the anointed. Even that phrase right there, anointed, some of your Bible translations may say the Christ. Because when we say Jesus Christ, we literally mean Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the anointed one of God. That is the idea. But then it says, so they raise themselves up against this anointed. And then the prayer in verse 27, he says, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Here's the thing. This idea of Jesus being above all rule, authority, and power, even in Jesus' crucifixion, even in his going to the cross, they did not realize that they were accomplishing the predestined plan of God. See, God is so smart that he can get wicked men to accidentally accomplish his will. And although what these men chose to do is wicked and evil, killing the most innocent person ever, God got the victory. Because it was through his unjust death on the cross that God worked redemption for us. In his resurrection, he conquered sin and death and put all of those authorities, worldly and spiritual, to shame. This is what Christ has done. But even later in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 6, I want you to recognize this in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. As they are in Ephesus, this is not the only city that struggled to wrestle with this, but the Ephesians, there were multiple temples to multiple different gods. There were even temples that you could worship the emperor like a god. There was the temple of Artemis. There were some other temples set up. Ephesus was known as a big temple town. And they had all these other gods and powers. And the view of the world at this point and scripture also seems to indicate that even in the spiritual realms, that there are angels and individuals on both sides with different levels of authority. You can even see that if you get deep into Revelation. But here's the thing. All these authorities in their world in which they're growing up, they see all these other gods and all these other creatures out in the world. And it's one thing to believe in God, but to believe in Jesus like he's just another God among others is a temptation that they struggle with. Like, Jesus, please help me if, you know, Artemis or somebody else doesn't get in the way and fight you and try to stop you. And some of these Ephesians have been really deep into witchcraft. And they had dealt in the dark arts and they had dealt in all of these other things. And so for these young believers that have given up those things to follow Christ, it was important to Paul to make them recognize that Christ is above all of it. That Jesus Christ whom you have a personal relationship with is above every other one of these powers. So you need not be afraid of them. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Think of how much confidence you would have in the armor of God if you knew, as he said earlier in the letter, that Christ is above all rule and authority, all dominion and power. The one whose armor you were putting on, the armor of almighty God. You serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the battle comes and fight it, you will. You will fight it with the armor of God and be victorious. Do you see that? This is the connection. This is why it's so important that we know who Christ is and where he stands. As a matter of fact, to a few of you, I've told this story, but one of the weirdest moments in my life was I remember being in college and I, we were in, a, uh, we're in just a public park, just kind of walking around. I had a walking course, swing set, all that good stuff. And me and another friend from college were talking and we kept discussing different deep issues and talking through things. 
And as we were talking, we noticed as the sun started to go down, there were some kids in really dark clothing, uh, really gothic, drab, uh, dark-looking clothing, all starting to congregate in this park. And they were going to do whatever witchcraft kind of dark stuff they like to do. I don't know. I mean, there was probably 60 to 70 of them, if I had to guess. I mean, it was like a dark church meeting. I don't know. But here's the thing. In that, saw a, saw a young lady that had left the world of witchcraft and had come to Christ. And when she had come to Christ, she had plugged in our church, and it was a, such a sweet time. We got to bless her and encourage her, and she was plugging in and really enjoying it. And then I saw, I don't think it was an accident, that God ran me into her. And I remember God running me into her, and I started talking to her. Because I, I felt led to kind of stick around, and I saw Renee, and I went and talked to her. And I told her, I said, Renee, you gave your life to Christ. This is not you anymore. You may have been tempted to come here, but you don't belong here anymore. And as I was talking to her, this person came up, who I recognized from high school. And if there was a good candidate for demon possession, this would have been it. Because he was very, he behaved very strange. He hit this phase where he really changed and acted really weird. He came up livid. He was so mad. He walks right, right up to me as I'm talking to Renee, and he says, I can see you with my third eye. And that's a, that's a witchcraft reference. He looks at me, and I just looked at him, and, and that's his spiritual eye, as they like to put it. I told him, I said, I, I looked right at him, I said, if you can see me, then you know who I work for, and you better leave me alone. He turned right back around and walked the other way. Christ is above all rule and authority. He's above it all. We as Christians need to know this. We need to believe this. We need to see this. He's above every name. Look in verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 1. It says that he worked in Christ and he raised him up from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. And then he says in verse 21, he says, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He's above every single name. You think, I think of Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. Paul tells the church at Philippians, says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God like a thing to be grasped. He basically, even though he was God, he didn't act like it. He emptied himself, it says in verse 7, by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. In verse 8 it says, Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. There it is again, the reigning king coming down, stooping so low to reach us. And then verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is above every other name. Here's the thing. You have here an image of Jesus dying on the cross and then being exalted above every other name. Here's the thing. If Jesus is not God, because this is an issue of authority, right? He has the authority of God. If Jesus is not God, then you're breaking one of the Ten Commandments in this verse. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's the thing. If Jesus is not God, the Ten Commandments says you shall not make, have any other gods. You shall not bow down to them to worship them. Bowing down to Jesus... And confessing that Jesus is Lord. That's breaking one of the Ten Commandments if Jesus is not God. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. 
to the glory of God the Father. Why is it to the glory of God the Father? Because it is the Trinity. Jesus is God. And Jesus, in fulfilling the role of reconciling all creation, ruling and reigning over all creation, brings glory to God. The next thing I want us to see is for us to realize the authority of Christ and the church. Verses 21 through 23 of Ephesians. It says, far above, talks about exalting his name, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body and the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus as Lord over all creation. Something similar is said in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Listen to what it says. It says, talking about Jesus, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He might be number one or the first. And in verse 19 it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Get this. Christ is head over everything. Christ is also the head of the church. That's us. Our boss, the one in charge, the one leading us, the one that we serve directly under, is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is head of the whole universe. This is what we need to recognize, church, that we are under the one who's holding every molecule and every atom together. Everything that is allowed to exist is existing because Christ is sustaining it. But look at this. In verse 18 of Colossians 1, it says, And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Then everything, he might be preeminent. Here's the deal. He's the head of the body of the church. He's first in everything. This is for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And here's the, here's the kicker right here, verse 20. For through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. If you go back a couple weeks, you'll remember when we talked about Christ's plan to reconcile all creation to himself. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians 1, we see it in verse 9 and 10. It says, Making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So if Christ is the head over all things and he's the head of the church and we are his body, what do you think our mission is? Our mission is to preach the gospel of reconciliation to the world. Christ is the head. We are his body. This is what we have to see. The church is working under Christ's authority. If Christ is the head over all things and he is the head of the church... What that means is that when we are in the will of Christ and accomplishing his will, we have his authority and his power. It's just like if you worked any job, if, you're, if you work any job and you're under a particular boss and he's only in charge of a small little section, but you need something really, really big from way higher up the chain, it's a lot harder to get it when your direct boss is just under your little spot. It's hard to get all the way up to the chain to the main guy up top. But church, good news. The guy that we work for, the guy that we follow, who is the head of the church, that's our boss. You need resources, you need power to be able to minister, to preach the gospel, to reach people. 
His power is unlimited. But let us ask, what agenda has he set for us? What does he desire the church to do? This is the catch-22 of the whole thing. Is that when the church is in error, or when we are not following God's will for the church, guess what we begin doing? We begin trying to do ministry, trying to do the work of God apart from his authority. The body's detached from the head, running around like a chicken with his head cut off. That's the image. We find ourselves floundering and doing all of these other things. He's the head. The body needs to line back up and say, okay, what do you want us to do? Because if you're behind it, it will not fail. But when we try to get off on our own reservation and do our own thing, it'll just be one more train rack after the other. Do I do this perfectly? Do all of us do this perfectly? No. But I pray for God's grace. Lord Jesus, keep us in your will. This is what is vital to the church having any authority. When churches try and stray from the Bible, when they try and stray from the commands, the will, and the way God wants the church working, we get off the reservation. And we become powerless. And we become functioning in the power of the world. We are his body, and it is him who rules over us. Look at verse 23. It says, "For which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now again, that idea of him filling all in all is part of his ministry of reconciliation. But guess what he wants to do that ministry through? The body of Christ, the church, us. He wants us to be part of his ministry of reconciliation. In Ephesians 4, Paul says, he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. We are one body in Christ. Ephesians 2.10 explains why God made us, why he put us together. For we are his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.19-22. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens. But you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, which is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, the first piece of our foundation, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together as a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We're called to be a temple where God dwells. We are called to be the body of Christ. We are called to be part of his ministry of reconciliation. So that as God reconciles the world, he might fill all in all. Ultimately, this is for his glory. Ephesians 3, it says, So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God may now be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And he says down in verse 13, he says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Through the church, it's God's plan to put his wisdom on display. Not just to the world, but even to the heavenly authorities and all those people and creatures and whatever they are, angels in the heavenly realms, God puts the church on display that he might show his perfect wisdom and how he works in the church. Dear church family, this is why we're called to grow as a body in Christ. This is why we're called to grow in our walk with him, to rely on him, for him to be our everything. Because the source of our authority and our power and our hope to live the Christian life is found in Jesus Christ. Dear church, he is going to reconcile the world. There's coming a day when all of this brokenness that we see with this virus and the turmoil that we see in our world and all of this darkness will come to a swift end. And in it, the Lord will have reconciled those who are in Christ. And the Lord will reconcile this creation by making a new heaven and a new earth. But church, don't forget the authority of who it is that you serve. You're not walking in your own authority. You don't have the power to just up and decree that this is how something is going to be. 
But what you do have authority to do is the will of God. So church, with all of our heart, let us seek what is God's will for me individually and what is God's will for the church as a whole. Lord Jesus, what do you desire for us to do? We are your body. You are the head. Will you lead us? And as we walk in your will, we will walk in your authority and your power. Do you want to see that, church family? I want to see that. So let us pray and ask God for exactly that. Dear Lord Jesus, God, I beg and plead with you today. Oh Lord God, help us to be people of prayer. Help us to be people in your word. God, help us not to live this life under our own authority, our own little kingdom or will. But God, let us live under your authority. Father, will you show us your will? Help us to walk faithfully in it. God, if there is any sin entangling us or distracting us, Lord Jesus, let us repent today and surrender our will to yours. God, we want to see life and joy and the power of Christ in this church. God, will you please work in us? I pray today, Lord Jesus, that there's anybody, God, that needs to deal with a sin issue in their life, God, that they would give it up today and surrender it to you. God, I pray if there's anybody here that they've never surrendered their life to you as their Lord and Savior, God, that they would surrender to you today. I love you, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.